Okay, uh, hello everyone. Welcome back to our last virtual lecture. So this is the second of our virtual lectures. What I'm going to do today is, um, is I'm going to tell you about a few problems with the story I told you last time. So if you recall last time, I told you the accepted um, idea for the evolution of our universe. I told you how the universe began with the Big Bang and then it evolved through periods of radiation domination and matter domination, ending up at the present day. Now, it turns out that that story is in fact a little bit incomplete, okay? And to explain in what way that story is incomplete, I'm going to tell you about some problems with that model. And basically, the problems with that model have to do with initial conditions, okay? So the initial conditions on the beginning of the universe in the model I just told you about are a little bit weird. And I'm gonna explain what I mean when I say this word weird. So first, I'm gonna start with something which is called the flatness problem, okay? So what is the flatness problem? Remember last time, we talked about the values of all of these parameters, these uh, omegas, these dimensionless objects. In particular, I told you that the contribution to curvature in the universe today, omega c naught, was very small, okay? In fact, it could be zero within error bars. Now, what I now want to talk about is whether or not this makes sense, okay? Does it make sense for omega c zero or omega c to be small. And let me just remind you, omega c is the thing at all times. Omega c zero is the fraction of the energy in curvature now. So what I'm gonna do in particular is, I'm gonna derive an equation for the time evolution of omega c. as a function of time. And um, this equation that I'm gonna derive is going to involve all of the other omegas. Okay, so all the other omegas will be involved in this equation. And once we have that, then we'll understand what it is that is odd about this fact right here, that omega c is small now. Okay, so let's get started. What I am looking for is a nice expression for omega c dot, okay? So to get that, let's first write down everything that we know. Remember, there are the Friedman and Riot-Joliary equations. In an abusive notation, I often refer to them both as the Friedman equations, but they are a dot over a all squared plus kappa over a squared equals to eight pi g over three rho total, where rho total includes everything, matter, radiation, and vacuum energy. And there is also a double dot over a equals to minus four pi g over three rho total plus three p total, okay? And um, I'm going to refer to this equation, the second one, as equation star. Okay, now remember, now to remind you about another fact, for everything, for all sources of stress energy, the pressure, okay, of each of the components is equal to this number Wi times rho i. So the pressure for every component is equal to the energy density times a number, where that number was determined by the equation of state of the, uh, of the type of object that it was. So this wi has different values for all the different things. So remember, w for matter was zero, w for radiation was one third, and w for vacuum energy, w lambda, was minus one, okay? 
So if you don't remember where these come from, look back at your notes from a couple of lectures ago. This was still a in-person lecture. And um, you'll see that I give some explanation for what all these values mean. Okay, so I'm going to call this equation equation EOS for equation of state. Okay, okay, we're still not done collecting all the information. So let me now move on and uh, recall the definitions of all of these density parameters, these dimensionless objects. And uh, just for completeness, let me write them all down. You have them in your notes already. Omega C was kappa over h squared a squared. Omega M is 8 pi G over 3 h squared rho M. Omega R is 8 pi G over 3 h squared rho R, where R is for radiation. Finally, omega lambda is 8 pi G over 3 h squared rho lambda. Okay, so um, you get the idea. They're basically, except for omega C, they're all 8 pi G over 3 h squared times the corresponding energy density. Okay, so now let's finally get started. Okay, so first of all, I want a formula for omega C dot, okay? So what is that? Well, let me just directly differentiate this guy right here. If I do that, then I find that omega C dot is minus two kappa divided by H cubed A squared times H dot. That comes from differentiating the H and minus two kappa over h squared a cubed times a dot and that comes from differentiating the a okay now let me just write this in a slightly nicer way i can suck out a factor of kappa over h squared a squared and write this whole thing as minus 2 omega c times h dot over h plus a dot over a okay so I'm going to call this equation here, equation double star from now on. Okay, so far so good. So now I wanna work with this a little bit. It turns out it's helpful to have an expression for h dot. So let me now work out what that is. Recall that h is a dot over a. And so that means that h dot equals two Actually, let me write h dot over h squared equals to one over h squared divided by a double dot over a. That comes from differentiating the a dot minus a dot over a squared. That comes from differentiating the a in the denominator. Okay, so what do we do next? Well, we have this a double dot here. What I'm now going to do is eliminate a dot over a using the riot joule theory equation. So using the equation that I called star back a couple of slides ago, this is using the component of the Einstein equations that involves a double dot. If you look back, that involves rho total and three p total, okay? So I can use that to write h dot over a square h squared as one over h squared times minus four pi g over three rho total plus three p total minus h squared where this last h squared is of course just this one over here this is just h squared and i have plugged that into there okay so far so good what do I do next? Well, now I want to get rid of the pressures. Okay, there are these pressures floating around. I'd like to replace the pressures with the corresponding energy densities. So I can use the equations that I called equation of state. The equations of state, of course, just replace each, relate each pressure to the corresponding energy density with a proportionality factor of W for each one. So if I do that, what do I get? Well, I get h dot over h squared equals two 
1 over h squared minus 4 pi g over 3. Now I'm just going to sum this i over everything. So here i runs over matter, radiation, and vacuum. And I get something that looks like this. 1 plus 3 w i. Okay. And of course there's this minus h squared left over as well. All right. Okay. So this sum i, just to remind you, runs over matter, radiation, and vacuum. So i runs over those things. All right, so now we have an expression for h dot over h squared. And now, okay, wh why am I doing this? Well, the point is, of course, that this particular combination, rho i divided by h squared, is exactly the thing times some power of 4 pi g over 3, is exactly the thing that I was calling omega i up to a factor of 2. So in other words, I can now rewrite the first part of this entirely in terms of the omega i's. So if I do that, what I find is, so right, in terms of omega i, I then get that h dot over h squared equals 2 minus a half sum over i 1 plus 3 w i omega i minus 1. Okay. So this is a nice expression because you see everything here on the right hand side is manifestly dimensionless. Okay. So that's sort of nice. We extracted all the sort of dirty dimensionful quantities and put them on the left hand side. The right hand side is pure and dimensionless. Okay, now let's keep track of the goal. The goal was, of course, that I wanted to write down a formula for omega c dot. That expression for omega c dot that I'm trying to derive had a power of h dot over h in it, and I can now replace that h dot over h with this expression that I found over here. If I do that, what I find is so write omega c dot using this relation. And what I then get is that omega c dot equals 2 minus 2 omega c h minus a half sum over i 1 plus 3 w i omega i. Okay. So this is the final answer for omega c dot. Okay, so that looks pretty good. Um, we're not completely done yet. We can still do one more thing. We know what the wi's are for every type of, of um, stress energy, for matter, radiation, and vacuum. So let's plug in those values. Okay, what are the values? Well, again, we go back and remember the values are right here. Omega m is zero, omega r is one third, omega lambda is minus one. Putting those in, we find finally that omega c dot equals two omega c times h times omega m plus two omega r minus two omega lambda. This is the formula that we have been trying to derive. Okay, so um, again, this is just nice because you see there's very few dimensionful things here. There's a time derivative on the left-hand side, and you should imagine this factor of h is there to make up the units for that time derivative. Everything else here is manifestly dimensionless. And so this is a very clean way to think about how the universe evolves. Okay. Okay, great. So now let's apply this to the early universe. So let's apply this now, this formula, to our own universe. Okay. At early times.
Okay. At early times, omega lambda is negligible. Okay. There is very, very little omega lambda. You might remember this from our last lecture. So we can ignore that. And what we find then is that omega c dot equals to omega c h times omega m plus 2 omega r. Okay. Now, let's look at this. Okay. What kind of equation is this for omega c? So, first of all, notice that if omega c equals to 0 at some time, then the left-hand side, omega c dot, is 0. And what that means is that omega c equals to 0 for all later times as well. Okay. Okay. So in other words, if omega c starts out being 0 at some early time, like the Big Bang, then it stays 0. So in that sense, um, it might make sense for the curvature to be 0. However, this is, this is a point. This is an equilibrium point. Omega c equals 0 is an equilibrium point. But what kind of equilibrium point is it? Okay. It turns out it is an unstable equilibrium. So to understand that, let me just write that formula down again. We have omega c dot equals to omega c h omega m plus 2 omega r. Notice that both of these things here are manifestly positive. Okay. These are both positive things. So that means if you have a small omega c greater than zero, then omega c gets bigger and bigger as time goes on. Similarly, if you have omega c less than zero, then omega c gets more and more negative. In the first case, it gets more and more positive. In this case, it gets more and more negative. What that means is omega c equals to zero is an unstable equilibrium. If you tip it slightly away from zero, it'll run away to either side. Okay. Okay. So now we can ask, does it make sense? So does it make sense for omega c equal to zero today? Well, in a sense, it's very weird, right? Because, I mean, you know, you can see that omega c equals to zero is an unstable point. For it to be zero today is odd because, you know, you might have thought that something could have upset it a little bit in the past, and then it should be very, very large today, either very, very positive or very, very negative. So what this suggests is that the initial conditions of the universe were very finely tuned, okay? In other words, someone, something, God, the initial conditions, set omega c very, 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 very close to zero at the early universe so that even though it continued to evolve, it could not get too big. And so this is, um, this is really odd. It's, it's quite strange. It's like, um, you know, you, you wake up one morning and you find out you're at the top of a giant mountain, okay? It's just really weird because it seems like something very finely tuned happened to, to put you there. And that's the situation we find ourselves in right now. Okay, so this is um, this is called the flatness problem. Okay, so this is called the flatness problem, and um, you can see it's not really a problem. It's just a peculiarity about the initial conditions um, that the initial conditions for omega had to be picked very carefully. And maybe it's up to you whether or not this is actually a problem, but it's an interesting fact. Okay, so that's all for the flatness problem. So now I discuss something a little bit different. I'm going to now talk about something which is called the horizon problem. Okay, so 
So what this involves is um, I want you to imagine you sit right now and you look out into space in our expanding universe. What do you see? Okay, so here's our Earth, you're looking out into space. What is it that you see? And um, of course, I mean, you see all kinds of things, but I want you to imagine looking past all the stars and the galaxies, look out. As you look out, you also look deeper and deeper into the past. And I want to talk about what you see when you look arbitrarily far into the past. So to understand this, let's remind ourselves about the good old FRW metric. So the FRW metric is, of course, minus dt squared plus a squared of t. And um, let's just work with the flat one. It's not going to be very important for our purposes. And again, um, another way to dis uh, justify the flat one is to note that omega c is very, very small now. So the curvature is probably very, very close to zero. Okay, so here's the FRW metric. Now, I want to imagine doing the following change of coordinates. I want you to go from dt to a new time coordinate, which I'm going to call eta. Okay, so, oops, I messed that up. I mean, d eta, okay. And this d eta is called conformal time, or rather eta is called conformal time. All right. Why is it called conformal time? To understand that, let us put this new coordinate into the metric. So let's write the metric in terms of eta. What I find then is that ds squared is a squared of t minus d eta squared. plus dr squared plus r squared d omega squared. Okay. So this is an interesting form. The metric is a scalar function, in this case a of t, multiplying a flat metric, right? Because you will notice that the metric that A of t is multiplying is just flat Minkowski space written in polar coordinates where eta is time. So in this case, sometimes we call this scalar function a conformal factor. Okay, that's just terminology. And because eta puts the metric into this sort of conformal form, that is why eta is called conformal time. Okay. Okay. So that's just terminology. It's not terribly important. Why do we put things into conformal form? Well, the thing that's nice about conformal form is just that light rays are very simple in conformal form. Okay. For example, it's very easy to see that in this conformal form, uh, wow, I seem to have misspelled the word simple. In this conformal form, radial light rays just satisfy eta equals to plus or minus r. Okay. And again, we're familiar with this from our work on black holes. Okay, so there is something interesting about conformal time. So let's remember that in our own universe at very early times, we had radiation domination. Let's look at the structure of eta in this radiation dominated phase. So when we have radiation domination, remember a of t goes like the square root of t. So I can write it like this, a naught times square root of t, where I have put the big bang at t equals zero. That's just the choice of the time coordinate, but I'm allowed to do that. So this is the form of the metric if you have radiation domination. And we derived this last lecture. Okay, so now let's understand um, how eta behaves. If you recall from the previous slide, what is d eta dt? Well, let's go back and look at it. Here, d eta dt is just going to be one over a of t. 
so I get 1 over a of t, which is therefore 1 over a naught times the square root of t. Okay, so from this I can solve for eta, okay, this is a trivial integral. What I find is that eta of t equals to 2 over a naught times the square root of t. Okay, so um, now why is this important? The important thing here is that notice that at t equal to 0, at the Big Bang, eta of t is finite. Okay, in other words, as you go all the way back in time up to the Big Bang, eta approaches a finite number, which in fact I have picked to be 0. Okay, so um, what does that mean? If we now draw a picture of the universe, okay, so let me draw a picture of the universe. Here's R and here's eta, okay. So this is the Big Bang, say. So say right over here, eta equals to zero is the Big Bang. So we are at some later time. We are at some time eta now, okay? So this is us right now. And here's a picture of the universe. Now, imagine you sit and sit right now and look out into the sky. So in other words, you are looking at light rays that are coming to you from the distant past. Remember, light rays always satisfy eta is plus or minus r. So the light rays that hit us look like this. Okay. Now, the first thing to note is that we can only see a finite chunk of the universe. Okay. We can only see things that are inside this light cone. So this is the observable universe, and this part here is called the Hubble volume. Okay. So this is the part of the universe that we can see. Anything outside there we can't see. You'll notice it's kind of like the event horizon of a black hole. Indeed, there's a very deep similarity between this sort of horizon that you can see here. This is, in a sense, a horizon and um, the event horizon of a black hole. So now I want to talk about a paradox. Okay. So notice, imagine you're standing here on Earth. And first of all, you look up in one direction. Okay. So you look out this way and you see this point here. Now go to the other end of the Earth and look out in the other direction, and that means you look out this way and you see this point here. These two points have never been in causal contact, right? You can see that, right? This is the beginning of the universe. These two points, so the two points P1 and P2, have never been in causal contact. And that's obvious from this picture, okay? But now, if you actually do this, if you actually look out into the sky and look at what you see from the early universe, you can make a picture of what you see. And this is maybe a good time for me to show you what that picture actually is. If you look out into the sky, the picture looks like this, okay? So this is a map of the radiation from the very early universe. It is what is called the cosmic microwave background. Okay, so this is what the universe looks like. Now, the two points I'm talking about are two diametrically opposite points on this picture. This picture is the whole four pi solid angle of the sphere. I'm not sure exactly what points are opposite. Let's say this point and this point are diametrically opposite from each other. Now, the point is, it turns out that this color coding illustrates small temperature differences. If you actually look at the numerical value of these temperature differences, they are very, very, very small. In other words, it looks like P1 and P2 are at almost the same temperature. So that's actually very strange because they have never been able to talk to each other. They have never been in causal contact. So how did they know 
that they had to be at the same temperature? How did they have time to reach thermal equilibrium if they've never been in causal contact? So again, this is a very peculiar thing. It again is evidence for fine tuning. It's a bit like when the universe was started. First of all, it was started to be very flat. And second, it was very carefully started so that all the different parts of it were all at the same temperature. Okay. And, um, you know, again, that's not really a problem, but it is very peculiar. And we call this the horizon problem. Okay. And I have actually simplified the horizon problem slightly for the ease of presentation. The truth is, we don't actually see the very beginning of the universe. What we see is the instant when the universe becomes transparent. This is called the surface of last scattering. And this is discussed in more detail um, in the references. So now what's going on here? I illustrated these two problems. What is actually happening? It turns out that there is a framework to discuss this. There's a framework where these problems go away. And that framework is called the theory of inflation. Okay. And what inflation suggests is that at early times, the universe expanded exponentially. Okay. It expanded like e to the h prime t. All right. It turns out if you assume that this happened, then this solves both of those problems it sort of gives the universe enough time to come to an equilibrium amongst itself, and it drives the curvature very, very small to zero. And in that way, both of these two things are, are understandable. And by now, you are all completely equipped to understand the theory of inflation. This is a completely um, understandable topic for you all now. In particular, if you're interested, I refer you to Sean Carroll's textbook, which is the recommended reading for this course. You can look at chapter 8.8, .8, where this is discussed in great detail. Okay. Okay, but just to recap, there are some peculiarities um, associated with this model. Really, my point in working this out for you was not so much to show you that there's peculiarities, but just to give you some confidence in doing this sort of calculation and understanding how to manipulate things that have to do with this expanding universe. Okay, so um, that is the official end of this course. Under normal circumstances, there is a little bit more. There's stuff on gravitational waves. Gravitational waves are very beautiful things. I encourage you to look at the notes um, where this is all described. Gravitational waves can be experimentally measured, and it's a very beautiful topic. But of course, given the massive disruption to the course this year, both with the strikes and with the current coronavirus situation, we will not be covering it, and it will not be examined. So this ends the examined part of the course. And um, I just want to thank you all for your attention. You've been a, you've been a great class. I'm going to leave you with this final picture. I think this is a good thing to look at to end. This is a picture of the universe at the earliest times. And maybe this is a very good way in which I can end the course. So thank you, everyone.